I'm delighted to be joined by the president and CEO of the Hyatt Corporation, Mark Hoplamazian, who's been with Hyatt for the last 14 years. Mark, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Mark, um, as, uh, as we've mentioned to you, you know, we're really keen to listen to and, and showcase with the industry best practice when it comes to what you're doing in terms of frontline staff. And, and I know that um, you know, one of your philosophies as a business is um, you know, Hyatt. It's the Hyatt family. We in the industry all know about that, the Hyatt family. And it, it'd be really interesting to hear what you're doing and, and how you've taken the initiative on looking after uh, your, your staff, the, the medical community, your communities in general, and, um, and what you're doing there. Yeah, so it's, um, it's quite a broad topic, but um, I think first, first and foremost, it comes down to um, culture and in our case, purpose. Um, as a company, we have been very clear-minded and hyper-focused on our purpose, which is to care for people so they can be their best. And when we crafted that um, sense of purpose, uh, it was really meant to be reflective of the founding principles of Hyatt back in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Um, not something that we made up as a marketing device or, or some sort of um, ex post uh, realization, but something that was really grounded in, in how the company was founded. And um, it's about really a sense of care, not just service, but caring for someone. And to care for someone, you really have to practice empathy. You have to understand where someone is and what they need and, and then uh, behave and, and act accordingly. Um, we talk about caring for people, not just guests, because I think in many cases, hospitality companies just hyper-focus on service to guests. We focus on care for all people. Our view is that if we care for our own colleagues first, we will then allow them to be able to care for our guests and our customers, which in turn supports and promotes caring for our, our hotel owners. And to be their best is, is very important because um, in our business, um, we meet people where they are in their own lives. We're, we're not creating an altered reality for them. They, we have to meet them where they are and understand what they need and then be able to act accordingly. And that this practice has come in uh, to be absolutely essential in, in under, identifying and understanding what our own colleagues needed during this period of time. And it comes at a time when um, industry dynamics and the revenue um, profile have absolutely uh, disallowed us from being able to maintain full staffing um, and to be able to provide for all of our colleagues uh, in the same way that we did before COVID. So all of the other muscles kick into gear with respect to making sure that we have identified those who are most in need. We launched something called the Hyde Care Fund in order to make sure that those who were otherwise not supported through government programs who really needed additional financial support got it. Um, this is through contributions from our board of directors, from our senior executives, from the Hyatt Hotels Foundation, a number of Pritzker Family Foundations donated to it. And we raised a lot of money to be able to deploy to support our colleagues. That's just one dimension of it. But the things that I think were really most telling about how, we, how this sense of care came to life was what was going on at individual properties. So a number of properties created... Um, virtual meeting sites so that there was regular contact and connection because during this period of time, everyone felt so atomized and so disconnected. The idea of being able to stay connected and know that they've got a network of people who are there helping them is, was critical. The network effect of people that we unfortunately had to let go through uh, a reduction in force, we've created these communities and we launched an app actually um, within a couple of weeks of the time that we um, had to implement these reductions so that we could maintain connectivity despite the fact that people, former Hyatt member, members of the Hyatt family might have been without a Hyatt um, email address any longer. They still have a connectivity into the things that we were working on on their behalf and maintaining a network effect to help people locate and identify jobs. So those are the kinds of things that we've done for our own colleagues. Um, with respect to healthcare workers, um, we were very struck, by, as everyone was, by the incredible heroism and selflessness of so many healthcare workers uh, across the world. 
Um, it was most acute back in the April, May time frame in New York, which was getting hit very hard um, and was the epicenter of the outbreak in, uh, in the United States at that time. <clears throat> and we were uh, working with American Airlines to try to figure out how we could do something at scale. We identified um, Elmhurst Hospital in Queens as a, as a, a particularly hard hit um, hospital serving thousands of COVID patients their, their staff and their teams were working um, incredible hours to be able to actually cope with the outbreak and, and handling the onslaught of so many patients. So we, we got together and we crafted a way in which we could give each one of them a uh, fully paid for vacation after uh, they were, we were through the, you know, the pandemic phase and they could travel again. And it was, it was so incredibly uh, powerful because it was a sense of like hope and something that people could actually focus on for the future, not just for themselves, but also reuniting with family members who, who were so very much a part of the support network that they enjoyed because they're, you know, these individuals were spending so much time in such a high risk environment. So it was really satisfying. And it really, I think gave everyone at Hyatt a, a special sense of pride as it did at American airlines. And then beyond that, we've done some other things um, to recognize Individual healthcare workers. Uh, we created a friends and family rate for healthcare workers to be able to stay as if they were a friend or a family member of, of a Hyatt colleague. Um, we've also um, taken some special opportunities in different places to recognize um, healthcare workers when they're staying with us. And that's taken the form of, in some cases, some of our hotels have been host to many doctors, nurses, and other healthcare providers. For example, the high regency in Wuhan, which was the epicenter of the outbreak of the virus to begin with, um, was uh, the host to hundreds of healthcare workers during the time that um, the Chinese government had really ramped up resources into Wuhan. And um, the, the team there took special care to, to, to identify where different people had come from, which provinces they were coming from, and they customized the, the preparation of food for them so that they could feel a sense of like being home, eating home cooking kind of thing. Um, and so, and, and there are some other examples where um, hotels um, have uh, been destinations for preparing meals to deliver to um, frontline workers to help support them. So these are the kinds of things that we've, we've done on our own initiative to try to really extend ourselves to um, a group of people who've made a huge difference in the outcome to, of this entire um, virus. Mark, it's amazing that you say all that you have, and I must say you have my heart glowing and makes me feel, Jonathan, so pleased that we're doing this. Because importantly, with this initiative of Hospitality Tomorrow Gives, the incredible leaders we're speaking to, like yourselves, none of them want the profiling. None of them want the PR, the marketing, or the praise. And yet you're doing something fundamental because a critical reason why we're doing this is that we're in August now. We're on the eve of you know, the, the fourth quarter. And yet the world is either fearful of the pandemic being invisible and still out there, flippant about the pandemic, frustrated, or they've just forgotten. And yet we know that as especially the Northern Hemisphere goes into flu season, there's a whole different cocktail now that we have to deal with in terms of the virus. And yet you're still doing this and you're still doing this in a way that's going to require support. If we look to everything that you've done at a staff level, and I love the fact that you've gone from service to care, and it's the value system you've been displaying at all levels. If you look at the fact that you've got your staff, you've got the healthcare workers, and those guests, those in the community who feel helpless in wanting to do something, even if it's just giving points, how are you finding your need for momentum and your focus in terms of what you can do shifting, if it is, looking at the potential of second and third waves going into the end of the year? You know, it's a, it's a really, really important question because um, this, this disease has required um, everyone to build and use <laughs> at the same time resilience um, because it's, um, it's one of those things where um, we just need to continually recognize that there's going to be changing circumstances. Uh, and you, you identified one key area where we need to be very um, sober about what, what's possible. 
and therefore what we need to do to prepare um, to, to move forward. There are some specific things that, that individual hotels have done that, is, that, that are wildly inspiring, engaging with um, local communities to help, try to help support them. Um, one, of, one, of, one of the examples that, I, that comes to mind is that um, one of our hotels in Baltimore, for example, you know, the, the, the small businesses, especially in, um, in, the, in the restaurant space, have been hurt tremendously. And many of them are just unable to actually operate. So what the hotel did is they opened their kitchen to local chefs who could come in and cook their own dishes and their own preparations and then sell those through either pop-ups or through delivery um, to help support those individuals whose businesses themselves were shut down. And I just think that sense of like common, um, we're in this together, uh, a common sense of, of support is exactly how people were feeling very acutely in March and April. It's dissipated a bit. It's dissipated because there's stress and there's, there's anxiety and there's uncertainty and it infects that sense of like, we're all in this together. And now I think people are really, you know, in some cases suffering from the stress of, and the duration of this. And this is a really a call to action to say, no, no, Reminder, we are really in this together. And how do we actually demonstrate that and live that and hopefully uh, promote that? But there are other things that I think are really important. I think as an industry, um, it's essential that we recognize that we, we continually need to find ways to support those who are most in need of it. So um, across the industry, actually, this is coordinated by the American Hotel and Lodging Association. Um, they, they, they initiated something called Hospitality for Hope which was a, a program to really provide room capacity for frontline workers, especially. And um, I'm proud to say that we are a big participant in it along with all the other major brands. And to me, I think, again, it's a really important um, thing to maintain and keep alive because to your point, there's a, there's a chance that we will need to be there again to help support those who are at most risk and who are most essential um, in the event that there were to be, you know, a further outbreak. I would just say at a macro level, there are many downsides to COVID-19. Um, there are all of the physical realities of the disease. There's the mental stress and strain that has resulted, I think, in a lot of mental health concerns that are completely and totally valid. The one enormous upside in my opinion, is that it has brought to the forefront a true sense, of, a true practice of empathy, where people, uh, till this day, all of my inter interactions and engagements begin with a sincere inquiry about how that person is doing, how their family is doing, have they kept well through this period of time, um, what's, what's real and current for them, so that I can really connect with where they happen to be. And I, I found it amazing that uh, I see this practiced everywhere. So if, if you recognize that there's this massive elevation in the true practice of empathy, that's a huge upside to this. Beyond that, also the sense of care that extends from that uh, when so many people have taken extra steps. Even colleagues of ours that were not instructed to do anything, I, you know, one of our teams at, in New York uh, had a colleague who was treated at a hospital for COVID-19 and the team got together and visited the work, the healthcare workers that were caring for that colleague and gave them gift cards to, to come stay at Hyatt. Uh, we didn't, they didn't get a memo from us to go do that. This was like a, just a sincere step of true emotional uh, connect, you know, uh, impact and connection. These are huge upsides for human beings, for human, the human race. So what I think we're going to need to lean on uh, frankly, to answer your question in this fourth quarter and into next year is that sense of care. And I'm, I'm very optimistic. I feel very, um, I feel very uh, um, encouraged and optimistic that, that that will carry us a long, long way. It's interesting you say that because I've always believed that the world being locked down, especially for all of us perpetual travelers, COVID-19 has not just shifted the value of travel, tourism, and hospitality, but the values of travel, tourism, and oh. hospitality. And I love yeah. what you're saying that your, your, your support is not just through supporting the frontliners, but the frontline supply chain and communities taking the infrastructure prop 
pressure off of them so they can yeah. utilize your hardware to get their software out again. That's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm just, I'm really, I am really proud of them and proud of it. Uh, not because I can claim any responsibility for it, but I do think, you know, there's some dimension of it being an outgrowth of, of our purpose and how it's being fulfilled and how current, how present it is in everyone's mind at Hyatt. So I think that does have an impact, but the, the actual innovation that's going on at that front, at that point of, of interaction and contact and connection is really, it's inspiring. It's very special. And, and Mark, how, how are you capturing all these wonderful stories uh, that your, your teams are doing around the world? Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, we have um, this, this app that we designed earlier uh, that I mentioned, to, I mentioned earlier, rather, that we designed to help maintain a platform for all members of the Hyatt family, current and former, um, no matter whether you're on our systems or not. We, we do have a large intranet uh, platform but that doesn't actually serve those who, who might not be with us at this time. Um, and so we, that, that's one vehicle through which we continuously post both local content, uh, that is hotel level content or teams that are in the field that are observing these things and, and also, excuse me, sharing how business is progressing and how uh, different hotels are serving guests that are in-house in or customers. And, but also these stories of care. And um, we've been doing it internally and sharing it with our internal folks, but we decided that it was really important for us to share it with this broader community. So that's been the primary vehicle that we've used. Um, and, um, and the way I find out about many of them is the uh, emails or the calls or the text messages that I get from, first of all, colleagues, but also people who are impacted. Um, I got uh, a tremendous number of emails from the Elmhurst Hospital employees individually saying, you know, describing their own personal circumstances and, and describing why it was so important for them to feel like someone was supporting them. Yeah. Mark, do you think that with what you're doing as a, as a business, that you're changing the, the way people look at our industry as well? Because with this empathy, with this human connection, with what your, your teams are doing on the ground, I can only assume that they want to get back engaged again. They want to come back into the hospitality as soon as they can if they've been let go. Oh, there's no question about that. There's a tremendous level of focus and attention on what the recovery is going to look like. People want to be back in the industry. Um, frankly, there's... And from a guest and customer perspective, it is unambiguous. The pent-up demand is vast and deep. And I, um, I'm extremely optimistic that once we get to the other side of, um, of course, a vaccine, a widely distributed vaccine, but even before that, uh, you know, a testing environment where you've got more frequent daily tests of different types where you get rapid results, plus therapeutics that are under development that I think will have a, a very significant impact on people's calculus in their own minds about their decision to travel. I think those things will end up allowing people to get back on the road. Of course, the vaccine will be a massive unlock, but that might take some time to actually realize. So I am very, very optimistic that that will be the case. I do think that the, the sense of, of um, uh, the, the tremendous human desire to explore, but also to reconnect with so many friends and family that they have not, you know, people have not seen for an extended period of time will drive a lot of travel, um, you know, when we're on the other side of this. But yes, I think um, we've been uh, very deliberate about trying to support all of our colleagues. And for those who we've uh, had to separate with, um, I got an email this morning uh, from a former colleague who we, we, help them identify an opportunity and then connected with that potential employer and were able to help uh, put that person into a new position. It makes such a huge difference. Um, and by the way, the way I view that is um, I've got to care for that person to be their best, no matter whether they work for Hyde at the moment or not. 
of course, in this case in particular, I really pray that we can reunite with that person and he, he will once again become a member of the Hyde family. But in the meantime, um, you know, we need to do everything that we can to try to help uh, those folks find a home. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. If uh, Anessa, uh, Anita has one last question. I've got, I've got one, and that is if there was anything that you could do differently since this outbreak uh, took hold, um, what would it be that you would do? Um, I guess um, based on how things have evolved, we, um, we as leadership in the, in the industry got together with, through the vehicle of HNLA to um, lobby for support for the industry. Um, and the, all of the initial uh, actions that were promoted and then put into place by the U.S. government through the CARES Act were uh, essentially blunt force instruments because they, they needed to act very quickly which thankfully they did. Um, so I, I'm not complaining about the rapidity with which they acted, but I, I guess if, if I knew then what I know now, or if we collectively knew then what we know now, we might've um, worked harder to figure out safety nets for individuals. I'm not so concerned about the loan provisioning because I think the, the, the PPP was effective. Uh, it's not perfect. And there are other dimensions of capital support that owners absolutely need that we continue to fight for. But to me, maybe the most important uh, dimension, this is, just, this is not just for our industry, this is across the economy that I think is really consequential is we simply need to figure out as a public policy matter how to support so many, and in the US it's 10 million or more uh, unemployed people, um, who will uh, potentially have a hard time finding work for many more months. Um, so as part of its compensation uh, and you know, unemployment benefits, but a lot of it has to do with healthcare benefits. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if I had had more time and were, if we collectively had more time, had more insight and maybe more expertise brought to bear, we might've, uh, we might've put some wheels in motion back then um, that might've turned out differently. It's hard to say exactly. Um, but um, I continue to see that as a, as a key need, and it's something that we continue to advocate for at, uh, daily. Um, we are, uh, and I'm really proud of this industry. I think all of the leaders in this industry have stepped up together. Um, the, the attendance on these conference calls with the Treasury Department and with legislators is incredible. I mean, it's really inspiring. So I think it's been an essential, essential thing for us to do as a collective matter. Well, we've always been good at uh, collaborating as an industry, but I think now more so than ever, we've really come together, haven't we? And um, yes, I'm going to hand over to Anita to to close to close us off. Right. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Mark, I must say, talking to you now, this is why we created this program. There, there's there's no question about it. This is why I love working with Jonathan, and we can bring together examples of leaders who can show other people how easy it is just to do the right thing by doing something, just getting out and doing something. What I always get amazed at is the fact that when we look back, February, March was not that long ago, but it's a lifetime ago. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this year and all of the almost naive euphoria we had when we came into 2020 and the roaring 20s, we didn't know the roaring 20 would have such a bite to it. Why are you a better leader because of 2020? I think uh, every leader has been through a very elemental challenge. <clears throat> and um, I think anything that elevates your awareness of um, what the um, circumstance is for other people and internalize that and then act accordingly uh, makes you a better person for sure and therefore a better leader. Um, I think that um, agility and adaptability uh, are more important than ever. And I think this, is, this period of time has created the circumstances that 
absolutely require you to become more agile as a, as a leader. So I think it's I think it's those dimensions. It's really um, being in tune with uh, what others are going through, and then being very adaptable to then be able to address what those needs are. And by the way, this is not just a COVID commentary. This is also all of the racial justice and and equity issues that we have seen come to the forefront in the last several months um, has has further elevated the need for true awareness, not gaining knowledge um, and and being very open to understand what other people's life experience is and therefore what we can be doing differently as individuals in terms of how we interact with others and as leaders. I have a special responsibility to make sure that um, I am uh, helping others to, to, to practice the same, but then to also set the conditions for everyone to be able to, uh, to do things that will absolutely make a change and result in a more equitable world. So I think those are pretty powerful outcomes if we can stick with it and, and truly make the change, which you know, I feel is, is upon us. So this is not something that's a flash in the pan moment. This is a movement that's going to that's gonna have real legs to it. Indeed. And there has to be good that comes from this. So Absolutely. with your closing words, there's nothing more that I can say aside from, from Jonathan and myself, a very sincere thank you. You are a beautiful example of what our industry is so proud of and what we represent beyond the hardware. So from us both, Thanks, thank you for giving to Hospitality Tomorrow Gives you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Jonathan.